many, many of the world's, many of the world's favorite fairy tales uh, begin with once upon a time. The greatest story ever told could well begin with Once Upon a Tree. For it's there, if anywhere, that the Christian faith can be summarized in a sentence. Uh, G.K. Chesterton said, 1900 years ago, a man came into my world, and since he has come, I can never look at a tree without thinking of him. Paul will say, among many things, there are a lot of things that one might be tempted to glory in or brag on, but I want you to know that I feel forbidden by God to glory in anything but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world is done to death to me, and to which I am done to death by the cross. So the cross is central. Anthony Flew is one of the leading atheists and philosophers in the world in a collection of essays called New Essays on Philosophical Theology, he has this little dialogue with D.M. McKinnon. And he, sort of a concluding remark, says, in my view then, even to discuss religion, even to talk about it, is only made worthwhile because of the riddle of that one life lived and that one death died. Here is a man who's radically opposed uh, to the whole teaching that God is and the Christian religion and the like, but has seen some things, and this one in particular, that believers can so easily lose sight of. He said, the only thing that makes this whole issue even worth talking about is the death of that one man. What what does the cross mean? We talk about the crux of the matter when we're talking about something that we want to get to the heart of. The crux of the matter, the cross of the matter, We speak of things being crucial. What? Cross-like. We talk about putting things into the crucible. And on and on and on. At the heat and the pressure and the heart of the cross, everything else becomes peripheral. The rest is peripheral hangs around the outer fringes. When we do not link our lives with the cross of Christ, we take from them a connection with that which is central. And it isn't enough just to talk and say the same words over and over again about the cross. It's imperative for believers to find out what it means, what the cross means. It isn't hard to visualize a crucifixion. And what we read in the New Testament about what happened to Christ was not crucifixion at its worst. I mean, it went on without going into all the gory details. Crucifixion was one of the most brutal, not the most brutal, of course, but one of the most brutal crucifixions Uh, ways of killing people that men came up with. But without milking it for the physical details, 
we need to look at it and say of Christ's crucifixion. What does that mean? What am I being told here? What am I supposed to learn about that? And it isn't enough to, to speak about it in the same terms over and over and over again. It's too rich and deep and big for us not to pursue a full conviction concerning its meaning. Now, by full conviction, I don't mean that we will exhaust its meaning. But I mean we can get the feeling, both intellectual grasp and the emotional feeling about what the cross is saying to us. And then, God help us, we can tell the world what it means. What does it mean? What did the cross mean to those who knew it best, biblically? What does the cross mean to those who today know it best? The cross means that sin is real and must be dealt with. Carl Menninger, who established the famous Menninger Psychiatric Clinic in America, probably still the biggest of its kind and the most successful of its kind, wrote a book called Whatever Happened to Sin? And in it, he showed how not just the unbeliever, but believers have moved the word sin out and other terms in. And how that that religious element that the word sin brings in that other words don't bring in. How that the removal of that word has removed the notion of evil. We talk of crimes. That's a legitimate word. When a man murders and butchers someone, like the young ex-Marine just a week ago said, he has murdered over 60 in America, over 17 states. It's a crime. But that's not all it is. And the other young man who a couple of weeks prior to that, uh, where people discovered smelling it, that he'd been keeping corpses in his home, murdering and cannibalizing his victims. That's a crime, of course. But it's more than a crime. And so you, you, you take that where it goes. You get your own illustrations and uh, see that. It's lack of housing and jobs and justice that make people evil. See, that's true. That's true. When you push a man and drive him to madness, sting him into madness, he will choose the evil way. And so it's all right to say that bad conditions, injustice, oppression, exploitation, all make people sin. It's true. And yet, it's not true. For people don't, uh, people aren't shaped and made by ghettos. Ghettos don't make people. People make ghettos. The people who frame the laws are already evil. They frame them in their own favor. The rich are the powerful who take the laws already framed and use them to oppress the poor, to silence the voiceless. Sin's already there. Poverty and loneliness and bewilderment and drunkenness and cheating and lying and adultery and all of these other things. The deforesting of countries. The suppression and oppression of, of defenseless people. The, the social reasons for abortion that aborts millions of defenseless babies throughout the world. All of these are expressions of something that is already there, invisible, but real. And the cross says, there's more, there's more to it. There's more to the mess we're in than lack of housing, lack of jobs. How do I know that so? Well, first of all, the scriptures say so. And the Christ is a manifestation of it. But you and I know people who have got fine houses. 
enough money to eat any time they want to eat, and once in a while you go on a nice holiday somewhere, which I'm sure they uh, richly deserve. And they're still bound in wickedness. We know people who've lived in absolute poverty who cannot be named into ungodly, flagrantly dishonorable people. They stand up and say, I may be poor, but I will not do that. So, it isn't tough times that make people evil. It's evil that help, helps create tough times. We've just got it inverted. Now, I don't wish to deny that when you push people into a corner, when you leave them hungry, when you leave them jobless, when you leave them embittered, when you, when you leave them and you steal from them and do whatever, you do. You do, and the Bible will talk this way, causing people to sin. You do that. But the people who are doing that and exploiting are already expressing evil. And let me tell you, sin is not... Um, it's not monopolized by one group of people. I believe in predatory wealth. I believe there are people who use their money to see to it that people don't have an earthly. But I also believe that there are predatory minorities, that there are minorities who insist on getting their way. Selfishness occurs in the poorest homes and in the richest. It's pervasive. And God in the cross wants us just, just for a moment, and you do it right here, just for a moment, concentrate on the cross and say to yourself, what am I supposed to see here about ungodliness? The cross condemns the world. John chapter 12, 31, now is when? Not the final judgment, that's coming. But when the crucifixion is spoken of, he says, now is the world judged. The cross of Christ condemns all our selfishness. It condemns all our self-promotion. It, it, it uh, condemns all our self-defense. It condemns all our self-reliance. It condemns all our whatever, as you see. And so when we look there, we all feel convicted or should, all feel convicted, I am not like him. And what he has done as the representative man is to condemn all of our evil, all of it. And there is none righteous. No, not one. To say, to say I don't need my sin dealt with by, the, uh, by God is to sever oneself from the cross. See, I don't think that everyone is equally wicked. I think it's sheer nonsense to say that there aren't some people who are morally better than others. It's sheer nonsense. Pick out someone you know. Someone who confessedly rather enjoyed the evil he did. Take Ted Bundy. Who's whose life, and I don't know where his roots are. God will take care of his roots. I'm talking about his behavior and his speech. Who was clearly shown they had killed at least 25, but confessed to over 100. Murdered and butchered. Uh, sometimes kept the record and enjoyed all of it. Don't tell me, don't tell me that Ted Bundy was not more evil than someone who, you know, with, with a flock of kids around there just didn't have time for church and didn't have much time for God and, and she told a lie when she thought it was going to serve her and her kids and on and on and on. I'm justifying nothing. I'm just saying that it's sheer nonsense to believe that everyone is equally wicked. Isn't that why the scripture says that for some it'll be more bearable in judgment than for others? Isn't that true? Isn't that why the Old Testament will again and again say it wasn't enough for you to do the bad things they did. You had to do things more abominable than that. You saw it and said, well, you think that's bad? Let me show you what I'll do. That's the book of Ezekiel 16 and the book of Ezekiel 21. That's Jesus Christ the Pilate. The ones who delivered me to you had the greater sin. It would have been better, he said, for them never to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from it, Second Peter. Of course there are gradations of evil. Of course there are. 
But to say, I believe that's true, but to say because that's true, that I don't need to come to terms with God about my wrong, is to sever yourself from Christ. And for God's sake, for God's sake, and for your own sake, and for the sake of all of those with whom you have influence, and you have more influence than you can dream, do not sever yourself from the cross. Don't look at the cross and say, that has nothing to do with me. I don't need that. To say I don't need it, to say I don't need the cross, is to sever yourself from the one event in all of human history that is worthy, that is, that is powerful, that is good, clean through and through from the Godward standpoint. Don't sever yourself from the cross. Don't minimize your guilt. Don't encourage me to whitewash mine. Don't ever talk to me and tell me you're not so bad. I am bad. And don't ever encourage me to tell you that everything about you is fine and that you don't need your sin dealt with. If you do that, you look at the cross and say, I want nothing to do with it. More than that, I don't need it. Don't say that. For God says to us, if you can beat me, if you can keep on saying no to me, if you can hear me talk to you in the cross, if you can watch me approach you in the cross and say, no, thank you. You have beaten me. There's nothing else I can do. Don't do that. Okay? The cross condemns all of us. In the light of that then, just to make it specific, what sin will I renounce today? What sin, when I get a moment on my own, what peculiar sin to me, what peculiar sin to you, what is it, what is it that you rather enjoy but hate? What is it that you rather get a lot of pleasure out of and still despise? What is it that when you get a moment on your own, you particularly zero in on that and use it as the, uh, as the paradigm for your whole life and say, I renounce that. And what virtue, what is there that, that you crave for, that you pursue and want? What virtue is it that, that, you, that you think, if I could only be like that, what virtue is it that you would embrace today and say, this I own as mine, this I want? Not just a single virtue, but something that stands for all that you long for. What, what you wrestle for most of all, what is there today in the light of the cross that you're going to say, that is enough. It stops here. And this I choose. This I purpose. This I will gear for. This I will do. This I, by God's grace, will deepen in. The cross said, sin is real and needs handled. One more point, I'll leave you alone. The cross says that suffering and the love of God can coexist. It says that suffering and the will of God can coexist. The cross says that suffering and the success of God's purposes can coexist. Now that can be really hard to believe. I don't believe, I don't believe for a minute that all the pain we see in the world is caused by God. I just don't believe that. I mean, it's sheer nonsense to say that God caused the death of a child when some drunk who didn't have the sense to stay out of his car drives his car and either maims or kills him. 
and fractures of families, sometimes beyond repair. It irritates me some to hear people blame God for that. Now, you multiply your own illustrations. A lady, missionary in, the, uh, in Asia for over 30 years, went to America for a holiday, was going to the bank. While on her holiday, stooped over to pat a dog and the brute ripped her whole bottom lip right off. Explain that. Makes sense out of that. You think God did that? Never. Suffering is not the work of God all the time. But now and then, in the scriptures, God calls women to be barren or a man to be ill or something or other, but for good purposes. And even when he hasn't done it, yet he assures us, I can turn it to good. Suffering's real, but I can take that, and if you want me to, I'll use it for your good, for the benefit of others, and therefore, when everybody's benefited, I feel glorified. But that's where the glory of God is. That's what's special about God. He cares for people. Yeah. Yes, but, but I look at the cross of Christ, and if anywhere I think, uh, uh, God's weak, he's, uh, he can't do anything. But it's right at the point where it appears that he can do absolutely nothing. But he's doing everything. And it's right at the point where you think, that can't be the purpose of God. That can't be the will of God. Right then and there. If we knew all the circumstances, we'd know better. But right then and there, it may well be that very thing. That that pain that's being endured, that that ouspitch that the people are going through, is indeed the purpose of God. How could God use that kind of nonsense and, uh, and do some good with it? How could we call it the purpose of God on the same grounds that we can say of the cross, there, above everywhere else, God was there. And God showed himself not only through suffering, not only by the cross, but in the cross, not after suffering. Listen to me. God did not show himself after the suffering of the cross. He showed himself in the suffering of the cross, in being hurt, in going through the ringer, in feeling the pain, not after it, and not just through it. That's true. What we can't believe, what we find it hard to believe is that it's in suffering that you see God. What's God like? He's someone who can be hurt if he chooses. He can be rejected. He can be grieved. Heartbroken. Someone says, that's all anthropomorphic. I don't give a hang if it's anthropomorphic. It says in the scriptures, over and over again, and Christ said, you want to see God? Take a good long look. And he says, he said, saying, oh, no, I don't want this. And in weeping over a group of people, who would spit on him? Feel all that pain? I don't care how you interpret scripture. I don't care about anthropomorphisms. I just know that the God of the scriptures is not the God of the philosophers. And this one, and there is only one, shows himself in the process of being heard. I learn about God in pain. In my pain? If I choose, if I open my eyes. People say, well, we need to explain and, and, and reconcile the goodness of God to suffering. I think that's right. We do. And yet, and yet, there are some aspects of suffering and pain that God doesn't want to be reconciled to. He doesn't want us to explain to people how he can be a good God while this injustice is going on. He wants us to eradicate it. He wants us to talk less and do more. He doesn't want us to explain it. He wants us to obliterate it. Christians ought to be in the forefront of any kind of progress in the medical world. They ought to be in the forefront in, in any area of influence where justice 
can be furthered and forwarded. They, they ought to be standing up to speak against it. They ought to be trying to alleviate pain. Albert Camus, an existentialist, has written a riveting novel, No Friend of Religion, Camus. Uh, it's a plague that happens in all around in North Africa where Camus was born and raised, as a matter of fact. This plague becomes just terrible. And the church, the Roman church, sends a Jesuit priest, a man called Panelo. And Panelo gets up and proclaims this message about this being a judgment on God. And the agnostic doctor, Dr. Hulu, says, he says, Panelo is a man of learning, a scholar. He hasn't come in contact with death. That's why he can speak with such assurance about truth, with a capital T. But every country priest who visits his parishioners and has heard a man gasping for breath on his deathbed thinks as I do. He tried to relieve human suffering before trying to point out its excellence. Christians ought to get involved. They ought to be doing something, but we can't do anything for the, the Bangladeshi hundreds of thousands. We can't do anything for the, the, the Indian millions and the, the Central and Southern Americans. I know. I know. I can't do anything. What would you like to do? But I, 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 I can't do it. What would you like to do? Well, I'd like to help those I could. We, that we can do. Who do you know? Who is it today that I'll think about? I'm going to ease that burden in some way. What am I going to do about this today? Huh? We should explain. But we should alleviate. Joe Bailey is not dead. Joe Billy lost three sons, two of them, to leukemia, and another one, late teens, in a drowning accident. He wrote a lot about sickness and dying. He got a letter, listen to this. On January 25th, this lady wrote this to Joe Bailey. On January 25th, 1973, in Memorial Hospital, John Risso, Red-haired, laughing, tall, 18, tractor-driving, cow-scratching, flirtatious, shy, died after two and a half years of leukemia. After six weeks of a raging temperature, experimental drugs, bleeding, and an abscess in his rectum that became gangrenous. He died soft and gentle, finally, after six hours of violent death throes. His face so thin. His hair, his hair only a memory, a soft red fuzz arms blue and green from shots and intravenous feeding. He looked like an old picture of a saint after his tortures were over. Why would a kind God do what was uh, done to John or do such a thing to me? I'm poor and have only second-hand furniture and clothing. The things of value were my husband and sons. All our lives we've struggled to make ends meet. How can I live with the memory of the agony he suffered? Part of the time he was in a coma. And then he, he used to keep on saying, Mama, help me. Mama, help me. And I couldn't. And it's killing me. I whispered in his ear, 
John, I love you so much. All of a sudden, his arm came up stiffly and fell across my back, and very quietly he said, from some vast depth, me too. You know, I know people are bad. And I know people whine. God in heaven, we're such wimps. But I too know that people are fabulous at times. Just absolutely incredible. And all the suffering can't kill love in people. And when I hear him saying to his mother, help me, and her leaning over and uh, saying to him in his ear, John, I love you so much. And then his arm coming up, falling across her back, and from somewhere, vast depth saying, me too. I think of the Christ. And I think of him saying to his father, Father, help me. Help me. And God leaning over and whispering in his ear and saying, Jesus, I love you so much. And him now reaching up and putting his arms around his father and saying, me too. And then dying. And I find him such a hero. I think he's so wonderful. And I think everybody who has the character and spirit of the Christ, who go through the ringer and who will not let it, will not let it drive love from their heart, I think he's pleased with them. Now what is it that I'm going to do? What pain am I going to bear? What pain am I going to choose? and live with it for the glory of God and still that love reign in my life. You two need to go. Is there, is there anything you wish to say or share? Ask or share, please. Would you pray with me? Apologize humbly and sincerely, Father, for the sin, the evil that is such a part of us all. But with Mark Rutherford, we we want to say, blessed are the people who give us back our self-respect. And with young John Risso, who in the middle of all of his pain, in the middle of all of his hurt, in the middle of that long, drawn out leukemia crucifixion, is able yet to speak of love for someone else. We're profoundly grateful and helped by his response to his pain. We want to be like that. And we think of the young Christ who, while John didn't choose his, Christ chose his. But who was afraid of it? And who was strong, crying in tears, said, Oh, oh, I don't want this. And yet did. And in the middle of it all spoke of love for you and love for us. 
We think him a hero. We're grateful for him. We're grateful for the message of the cross. We want more than forgiveness. We want a holy freedom. We want to quit our whining and to live gloriously in the middle of our pain. And we want to ease burdens. We want to alleviate suffering to the degree and in the places we know we can with a little money, with a kind word, with a touch and a look. We do. We pray.